the, the, the plastic strains with that criteria. So, uh, before we do that, let's compute what that vector n is. Uh, the vector n, it's a vector normal to this uh, yield line, and it's actually given by these derivatives. The derivative of this is going to give you uh, that vector n. So n is, if I write it in terms of principal stresses, is the partial derivatives of that function respect to all the variables. And let's see what this n is in this case. So what is the derivative of f respect to sigma 1? 1. Derivative of f respect to sigma 2? Derivative of f respect to sigma 3? Negative q. Right? And let's now apply this equation uh, for our plastic strains. Plastic strain in direction number 1, then it's just going to be this parameter uh, lambda, differential lambda times uh, df respect to, if this is 1, I should have sigma 1 in here, so times 1 in direction 2 is going to be d lambda times 0, and in direction 3 is going to be this d lambda times minus uh, q. Let's, before uh, we go into making another plot, what was q? You remember what was q? 1 plus sine of the friction angle divided 1 minus sine of the friction angle. Uh, if the friction angle, say, is equal to 30 degrees, then q is equal to 3, you remember? So what that means is that if I were to compute the change in plastic volumetric strain, what would that be? And which and it it's going to be q is bigger than one? Yes. So, and this is going to be a positive number. So what that means is that this is going to be a dilation because it's a negative change. So this one is going to, let's say it's 3, all right? So this 3, this is going to be negative 2, and this negative 2 times this is going to be a negative number. So this change is going to be a dilation. So remember, this one was positive, was a contraction this direction. This one was negative because it was a dilation on direction number 3. And everything together, the volumetric strain, uh, is going to be a, uh, a dilation. So according to this uh, Mohr Coulomb criterion with uh, something which is called the associated flow rule, uh, we're, we're gonna, I'm going to explain in a bit what that means. With this associated flow rule, uh, we predict that there is going to be dilation when we get to failure. That, that, that's what the equations uh, tell. Let's make a drawing about this to make this is a little bit more, a uh, little bit easier to, to understand. So let's say this is sigma 1. Let's say this is epsilon 1. So uh, um, if I run here a, a test in which I increase sigma 1 and I measure what is epsilon 1, uh, let, let's imagine that we have an, an elastoplastic material. That would mean that I can increase linearly stress with strain. That would be the elastic part. Uh, 
let me plot in this axis epsilon 3. Uh, what is going to what, what is going to be the value of epsilon 3? Uh, actually, the arrow epsilon 3 should go also should also go into into. Le, let me fix this. This this is just the axis of strain, and this is epsilon 1. Okay, so it's a positive. I apply a positive stress and it gets shorter in direction one. What about in the other direction? El elasticity, we are in elasticity. It's going to get, uh, uh, it's going to dilate. Well, not dilate, but, but it's going to expand. And it's going to expand as much, in, if we assume linear elasticity, proportional to the Poisson ratio, right? but it's going to go into the other direction. Let me add one more axis in here. This axis is going to be the volumetric strain. What's going to happen uh, as I increase uh, stress? It's, it's going to look, we have a compression in one direction which is uh, higher than the expansion in the other uh, two directions because of the Poisson effect. Uh, that's why the Poisson effect is less than 0.5, right? So we're going to have a decrease of volumetric strain. Let's say a point over there. Now we get to the yield point. And at the yield point, uh, we're going to assume for now perfect plasticity. And that perfect plasticity means that the stress is not going to change as we get to the yield point. And uh, therefore, what we found before is that an additional change of stress is not going to change the stress, but I'm going to get this much of plastic strain in direction one, I'm going to get, according to the equations that we just uh, showed before, I'm going to get three times as much of change in plastic strain in the other direction. And when I get to this point, I'm not going to have any more contraction, but at this point, I'm going to have a dilation. All of that is after the yield point or the yield stress. And in this plot, the volumetric strain is plotted against Epsilon 1, okay? Uh, so, so that's why it changes as you change that one. But, but this is what, what Mor Coulomb is, is telling me. It's telling me that uh, after I get to the yield point, stresses do not change anymore. And uh, the plastic strains are going to change according to these equations. Uh, with a, with a, um, a law that is linked to the failure surface. As long as I can compute uh, this uh, normal vector to the surface, I can tell you what is going to be the change in plastic strains. So it looks like it wasn't that difficult after all, right? So now we know, we know the failure surfaces, we can compute plastic strains. You, th you think that's the end of the story? Probably not, right? It's not, it's not the end of the story. This is just the beginning. Uh, so it turns out that sometimes the utilizing this uh, flow rule 
which is directly linked to the yield surface, it doesn't, have, it doesn't give you very accurate predictions of plastic strain. So instead of that, uh, what you use is another equation which is similar to that, but it's not exactly the same. Uh, and, and that takes us to the concept of the non-associated flow rule. So if I say that the plastic strains are linked to the yield surface, the one that I use to find the yield stress, then this is called an associated flow rule. However, I'm not stuck to that. I can use another function, let's call it G, for which I can uh, predict also plastic strains. And um, when G is different than F, then that's called the non-associated flow rule. So basically, the, the associative part means that the, what is called the plastic potential function or plastic potential surface is not associated with the yield surface because G is different than F. So those are going to be two different functions. Uh, sometimes, though, they are not super different. In some cases, they are. But in some others, they, they, they are not. Uh, yes, Robert? Can I ask, what is lambda? Lambda is just a parameter that we're going to see later on how we find that so number. Is it, it's, is it, it not the parameter? No, no, it is not. It is not. No, no, no. It, it is just one parameter. It's a constitutive parameter that allows you to tell you exactly what is that value uh, with the change of, of stress. But it's, it's just a parameter that sometimes uh, actually you can, it's a, you can fit it to equations or, or you can derive it from some other additional theory, additional assumptions. Okay, so let's talk about this G, yeah. Well, F, we saw that has a physical meaning, right? F, if you have a, a, an associated flow rule, those are the plastic strains that you have after shear failure. And they depend on the direction of, of the stresses. Uh, th this is the easiest way I, I have in order to explain that for the normality. Um, but... Um, I'll try to come up with some other examples if I, if I can find. But having something normal to the yield surface, that, that makes sense on, with calculating the plastic strains. But sometimes they do not make that much sense, and that's why you have to propose a new plastic potential function. And this, this is what we're going to do right now. So. Uh, the predictions of dilation of the Morcolon by itself sometimes, are, as I was saying, are not very accurate. And instead of that, you can use a function g, which is very similar to the function f, but instead of having a friction angle, now you have something different, which is not a friction angle anymore, but it's called a dilation angle. So with the combined Morcolon criterion, which is F, and with this plastic potential function, which is G, with the dilation angle in which the dilation angle is usually lower than the friction angle, you can predict better uh, strains, dilations, using more or less the same criteria, but now this is a non-associated flow rule. You're using 
uh, another parameter, and this is actually a parameter that also you can fit. You can fit and you can find its value according to the, to the actual data. So we have, in order to predict yield stress, then we use the Morcolone criterion in order to predict plastic strains. Now we have this plastic potential function. We saw that if that dilation coefficient is equal to the friction angle, that gives you a lot of dilation. So this dilation angle, now if you were to use this uh, non-associated flow rule, uh, if the dilation angle is higher than zero, that will mean dilation. If the dilation angle is equal to zero, that will mean no change of volume which is the same isochoric uh, evolution. And if the dilation angle is less than zero, that would mean contraction. So l let's try to see uh, physically what, what this uh, would mean. But before I do that, let, let me change a little bit so we get ready for the for the next the next thing. The same as uh, I I wrote this equation of a Mor Coulomb uh, failure on a sigma one sigma three space. We know that that's equivalent to a sigma n tau space, right? It was it's the same thing. Over here also I could get a a normal uh, vector to that surface and that normal vector uh, would tell me what are the strains in the direction of sigma n or the strains in the direction of tau. And similarly to that I could also write these equations in terms of square root of j2 and invariant number one and this is also going to be a line. And it's going to be a line in which I, if I have a normal vector, I can decompose that, those plastic strains into a component which is going to be the plastic strain in the deviatoric direction uh, and remember that this is also a function of P and Q uh, let's not use F here let's use something else FG let's use H and this is let's say H star. So what I mean is uh, here also this is a graph that you can plot in terms of Q and P, right? The, the Q and P plots we have been doing so far. So you, you can decompose that plastic strain into the deviatoric part and into the uh, compression part. It's the same thing. Uh, so this is the same thing as, as that, uh, but it's just they, they have a different, uh, a different uh, meaning uh, uh, related to what is Q and what is P. But we're going to see that in a little bit, okay? But it's a similar thing. So uh, if I were to use uh, then this type of uh, failure surfaces defining P and Q, which is mostly the norm, instead of using sigma 1 and sigma 3, uh, then I could write a failure surface that maybe, as I showed you before, on the yield surfaces, well, let me show that one more time. So these ones, the, right, all, the, all of those are failure surfaces. Uh, I could simplify that in terms of P and Q, and this may look something like 
like this, uh, in which I exaggerate a little bit over there. Uh, usually that would be normal to this line P, in which if the yield surface it's has a positive angle, look, the normal vector would be in this direction, and that would mean that I'm going to have uh, dilatancy, same as I did before. Remember, when, when we had the, the, the Mohr Coulomb criterion, uh, whenever the dilation angle is higher than zero, that means dilation. So in any point of this yield surface, that I have a, a positive angle, uh, this is going to mean dilation. If I get to into a section in which I transition into a horizontal line, this is going to be when there is no isochoric deformation and as I go into a section of the yield surface where I have a negative angle this is going to mean contraction. So the shape of the, that yield surface and wherever you go and pass the yield surface is going to tell you either if you have dilation if you have no change of volumetric strain or if you have contraction. Let's try to make physical sense out of this and why, why this is like this and why it works as, as, I, as I did in these schematics. Imagine that we're dealing with a, uh, a loose uh, sand. Well, it doesn't have to be loose, but uh, an uncemented sand. We with grains that are very close to each other at what is called the minimum porosity <coughs> or the minimum void ra ratio. So if I were to apply shear to this very well packed sand so that I want to move these grains down and these other grains up and I want to uh, create a displacement. What is going to happen to that sand? Can you see that it's going to dilate? Because this grain, in order to go over that grain, has to roll over and expand. It has to move in this direction. And as it moves a lot in that direction, it dilates a lot. So in this case, that I have small mean stress, high deviatoric stress, I would expect to have dilation. However, you could be at the same level of shear or deviatoric stress, which is Q, and do the same thing. Again, here I have the grains. Let, let me make the grains a little bit bigger. And I want to do the same experiment. But now, I also have stresses which are significant in the normal direction. And now I want to do the same. I want to apply shear stress to make this move. What do you think is going to happen if I have significant stresses? Well, but, but I, I really, I want to shear this. I want to, I want to make it move. Any, any thoughts? Yes. I mean, you, I mean, was, you might get some initial dilation and then it would start to contract as it settles into the 
I, I think you're, you're going to an intermediate case in this example. Uh, but here, if you have a lot of normal stress and a significant shear, what you may expect in this example is that as this one tries to go roll over this one, the stress may be so high that now these grains start to fail. And as the grains, they break, all of those pieces get into the bigger pores. And as they get into the bigger pores, actually your porosity now is going to decrease, right? And if your porosity decreases, in this section, now you're going to expect a contraction. So you still have shear, but now your granular medium is actually getting smaller. Before, you weren't causing any, any crashing, and it, it dilates. Now it causes crashing, and it contracts, because smaller pieces go into the pore space that before was pore space, and now it's not pore space anymore. And in the middle, uh, you're going to have this uh, kind of isochoric deformation in which, uh, as Michael said, uh, you may have some initial dilation at the beginning, but when it starts moving, it really doesn't feel that the dilation, the contraction may, may cancel, and there is just no change in the volumetric strain. But that would be something intermediate between this and that. Yes, Steve. In this case, yes. uh, well, it, if you are using the associative flow rule, mm -hmm. then it's they, they are the same. If, if you are not, then uh, it's not going to be the same. But but in this case, it, it, this one could be could be G, it could be F. Okay. If it's associative flow rule, it's it's the same. Exactly the same. Um, so. This is the reason for some of these caps to have uh, that shape. And because when we get into excessive compression, we start to see contraction instead of dilation. And, and this is the, the type of failure criterion that we're going to use uh, in order to uh, expand these plastic strains into, uh, into a more advanced, consistent elastoplastic model. The more Coulomb, as I was telling you before, it works more or less well. Uh, you can fix it partially by changing the friction angle by the dilation angle, and that, that would work more or less well. But if you are serious about uh, calculating plastic strains, uh, you, need, you need something a little bit more sophisticated. And, and this is what we're going to talk about right now. Okay? So we have 15 minutes. I don't think we're going to get too far today, but uh, let's get started. So there are many of these uh, models, but we're going to discuss one which is very popular and is very useful. And it's a branch of what is called critical state soil mechanics. We're going to see that this type of uh, constitutive model considers something which is called a, a critical uh, state condition in which it's called critical because at that point it doesn't change anymore. It just reaches that state and it doesn't change anymore. And out of those families of constitutive models, elastoplastic constitutive models, there is one which is called the Cam Clay model, where clay comes from clay, right, and cam comes from Cambridge. Um, because it was developed uh, over there. What? The university. The university. Uh, all right, so 
in this type of model, uh, we're going to work as we were doing before in the PQ space, where this P and this Q. Uh, we're going to consider the case of uncemented sediments. But this one, this one can be expanded also to cemented sediments. But let's consider the case of uncemented sediments. And, uh, and as I said before, you know, it's called clay because it's, it's better suited for, for uh, sediments with, with clay, with significant amount of clay. All right. So in this model, uh, we're going to have a, a yield surface and a failure surface. And these are going to be two separate lines. One line is going to be one straight line with the slope m. And this is called the critical state line. And as, as you may guess from what we have seen before, uh, it is uh, what kind of failure would you associate this with? It's a shear, right? It's a shear failure line. And in addition to that, we're going to have another surface which is going to look like an ellipse. It's actually an ellipse. When we write equations, you will see that it's, it's an ellipse. Uh, and it's very difficult to get this ellipse. So something like that. And it, it will go on to the other direction to be something like, like this. OK, well, let me try to improve this. OK, so uh, this is what we're going to call the yield surface. And actually, uh, now we're not going to restrict to perfect plasticity anymore. But we're going to have a yield surface that changes. So this is going to be our initial yield surface. OK? Uh, remember that we said this hardening rules, the yield surface changes uh, with plastic strain. OK. Um, here I'm going to plot epsilon 1, and here I'm going to plot volumetric strain. Before we get into analyzing what happens inside this space, uh, we need to define a few things. Uh, usually, this type of 